Good morning, and welcome to our service of worship on this third Sunday after the Feast of Epiphany. Please join me in our call to worship. The heavens are telling the glory of God, and the firmament proclaims God's handiwork. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night declares knowledge. We give thanks to God, who has created all that we have, and we sing praise to God, who has created all that we are. Let us pray. Gracious God, we come before you knowing that what you call us to be and want for us is sometimes at odds with what the world expects from us. Sometimes we feel on the edge between the world we live in and the world you call us to be part of. Show us your way, O Holy One, that we may learn how to be about your ministry even as we live on the edge. Open our hearts to receive your word in your guidance for our lives. Amen. Let us join together in our gathering song, Gather Us In. A reading from the Gospel according to St. Luke, the fourth chapter. Then Jesus began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, is not this Joseph's son? He said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Doctor, cure yourself. And you will say, Do here also your, in your hometown the things we have heard you did in Capernaum. And he said, Truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up for three years and six months. And there was a severe famine over all the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them, except to a widow at Zarephath in Sidon. There were also many leopards in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman, the Syrian. When they heard this, all the synagogue was filled with rage. They got up, drove him out of the town, and led him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built so that they might hurl him off the cliff. But he passed through the midst of them and went on his way.
Would you please pray with me? Dear and holy God, may the words of my mouth, the meditations on our hearts, and the wandering of our minds come to this place that we might hear your word in spite of our many words. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There's always been this kind of split between a rural community and an urban community. And it's interesting because wherever I've lived, there seems to be kind of an equal disdain for each other. When I lived in Illinois, I lived in a rural community, and we had a partnership with a congregation in the heart of Chicago. And we invited them to come and share in an anniversary celebration with us. And when I was talking to the pastor on the phone, I said, I was trying to explain where we were, and I said, we're, you know, we're a good three hours out of Chicago. Where are you again? I said, well, we're in Sheffield. Oh, I know where Sheffield Avenue is. I, I got this. That's only like 45 minutes away. I said, no, it takes us three hours to get to Chicago. We're not on Sheffield Avenue. We're in the town of Sheffield. That's three hours outside of Chicago. Well, the day of the celebration came, and we all gathered in our church waiting for them to come. An hour later, we're waiting for them to come. <laughs> It was well over an hour, an hour and a half later when they finally showed up. And the first thing he says as he gets off the bus is, it's a long way out here. Well, I tried to tell you that. I found that people in my rural community really didn't have a lot of good things to say about the big city. And when I went to the big city for meetings and such, I found that people in the big city didn't have a lot of great things to say about our rural communities. It's a prejudice, a deep-seated prejudice. And even Jesus, in his time, the people had that same kind of prejudice. For Jesus had been brought up in Nazareth, which was basically a rural community. And then according to Luke's gospel, he'd gone off to Capernaum and had some ministry there, which was a bigger kind of fishing community, would have been, would, would have been a hub or a center. And then he comes back to Nazareth, and in the synagogue, he's speaking, and everybody's like, wow, is it that Joseph's son, that little guy? And they're impressed, they're amazed for a hot minute. And then Jesus starts to preach, and they're ticked, they're angry. They turn into an angry mob and run him out. What did Jesus say that made them so mad? He told them about their history. They know who Elijah was. They knew who Elisha was. They know the Old Testament. That's the testament that was their testament. That was their holy scripture. They knew those stories. And when Jesus brought up the stories of Elijah and Elisha saying, you know, they weren't real welcome in their hometowns either. They didn't heal people in their hometowns. You want me to do what in Capernaum, you want me to do in Nazareth what I did in Capernaum, that isn't going to work here. We have our history to let us know that doesn't work for some reason. We don't really trust our own. We don't trust outsiders either. But we watched you grow up. We saw what you were like when you were a little kid, and I don't, we don't know if we trust you. In reading this text, and exploring this text a little bit, I thought, the more things change, the more they stay the same. What's the big fight we're hearing right now? Do we teach our history in our schools? Oh, we give it different names to make it sound like it's a bad thing, but we're basically talking about basic history. Do we teach our children today the history of our ancestors, a history that's wrought with racism, genocide, a history that makes us look bad. It's, it is what it is. What makes us look bad is not our history, it's the fact that we refuse to talk about it so that we don't repeat that history. They didn't want to hear Jesus talked to them about what things were like in the time of Elijah and Elisha. They wanted things to be the way they wanted them to be right now. 
They didn't want to hear the truth that he spoke. And too often, we don't want to hear the truth that is to be spoken. We want to ignore it. But when we do that, we are at risk of repeating past ills. We need to know our story. We need to know our history. We need to know where we come from, the good and the bad, so we don't repeat the bad. But if you listen to the news, you can see we are repeating the bad because we refuse to acknowledge from whence we have come. And if we don't know where we've come from, we're not going to know where we're going. They loved Jesus when all he did was read scripture. They despised him for interpreting it in a relevant way for their time. We need to listen to the prophets among us, those calling us to uncomfortable truths, those calling us to examine ourselves in a way that we don't want to do it, those calling us to create a different history for our children and our children's children and our children's children's children, and so on. We need our prophets. We need their voices to be heard loud and clear, even in our own hometown. Our prophets may be flawed because they're human, but that doesn't mean we don't need to hear their voices. We need to hear them we need to be in conversation with them and with one another on our difficult topics. And we need to find a way forward by being informed by our history, not by ignoring it. May we live this text in our time, listening to our history, learning about it, and moving forward in a prophetic way. Amen. Let us join our hearts, our minds, our souls together in prayer. Good and gracious God, you lay before us our history that we might learn from it, but too often we go running the other way. Your word that was spoken thousands of years ago is a word that we need to hear today in our time. For the human condition hasn't changed all that much. We are tired, some feel beaten down, some feel even hopeless. We beg you, dear God, to encourage us to light a fire beneath us that we can be a people, your people, who are prophetic and loving and caring. Help us to have conversations with one another about our difficult past and even our difficult present so that we can help make a future that is brighter and better. As we gather here today, we pray for our world, that our, our leaders can find ways to talk about peace rather than war, that we can acknowledge that some places are independent, 
and acknowledge that they are a people that deserve life and liberty. We pray for our nation as we continue with our struggles, whether it's gun violence or racism, sexism. Help us to find ways to heal and to offer hope right now and right here. We pray for the many who are in need of your healing in whatever form that that might take. We pray for Andy, Wanda, Larry, Carol, Rick, Gail, Brenna, Elaine, Lois, Bonnie, Kenzie, Marilyn, Donna, Mike, the Taylor families, Paul, Bill, Jim, Jill, Pat, Al, and Bailey. Each and every one of these are in need of your healing touch. We pray for them and their families as they journey along with them. Give them hope, give them strength, give them healing. We pray for those who have lost loved ones, for the families of Dennis, Frank, Betty, the many who have lost their lives over this past couple years through this virus, the many who have lost their lives for that other pandemic we have, gun violence. Lead us, O oh God, to be a people of peace and justice. Lead us, O oh God, to be a people of hope and caring. We pray for our search committee as it continues its work, and we pray for that person who right now is thinking about a change in ministry settings, that they might be praying for a place to come, and that place is here in Burlington. There is much that troubles our hearts, and so we pause for a moment of silence. Hear all that we have to offer you in our silent prayer, O oh God, and calm us long enough that we might hear your prayer to us. Having heard our individual voices in the silence of our hearts, hear us now as we bring all of our voices together as one and pray the prayer which your Son has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Our daily bread, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. It's the kingdom and the power in the glory forever. Amen. Once again, we'd like to thank you for the ways in which you've been generous with the church during these difficult times. We ask you to continue being generous as we are still doing a lot of ministry even though we are not meeting in person. 
Um, and we've had a lot of gratitude from the community over these past couple of weeks for some of the things that we have done. Um, we received a phone call just the other day from the rescue mission thanking us for our, do our donation to them. So our missions and our ministry continues both here in Burlington, across the state, across the world. Thank you very much. Our parting hymn is Lord of the Dance. And so we gather in this place that we might hear God's word to us, but then we are called to go forth and to live that word in all of our lives. May we go forth in the name of the God who created us, the Christ who redeemed us, and the Spirit who always and forever sustains us. Amen. <laughs>